Shalom and shalom, and welcome to yet another funky Bible commentation. Today we are diving in the reconstructed summary of the book of Giants, chapter 1. The watchers are grieved over the sins of mankind and petition God to let them descend to earth to teach the sons of men righteousness and to rebuke them. God grants their petition. Azazel is sent to prepare the way for the watchers. Azazel prepares the way and the watchers descend and they begin to teach them righteousness and justice. Enoch is chosen by the Watchers to serve as a mediator between men and the Watchers. Chapter 2. The daughters of men lust after the attractive Watchers and seduce them. Azalzal, with Shemhaza's help, integrates the fall of the 200 Watchers and their followers. The Watchers fall from their glorious nature and become bound to fleshly bodies as a consequence of their joining sexually to flesh. They begin to reveal to their wives heavenly and earthly secrets. Chapter 3. The Watchers have their own families with humans and also with animals. And those that were defiled by them give birth to giants. I, that's interesting. And also with animals. I, I didn't remember that quotation before. But that's an interesting one to dive into. Because what happens when Watchers and animals... Um, intermingle what happens with humans and animals when they intermingle maybe that's where we get all these you know half you know human head half animal kind of creatures throughout history maybe this is in chapter three so i'll read this part again the watchers have their own families with humans and also with animals and those that were defiled by them give birth to giants these giants begin to grow to massive science sizes and become full of greed and corruption they kill many dragons, and the sons of Cain worship them for protecting them. The children of Cain are no longer able to sustain the giants with their offerings of vegetables and grain. So the giants turn on them and kill them and begin to eat them. The giants develop a taste for blood and begin eating anything, any moving thing, including each other. The watchers teach some of their secrets. They were appointed over to keep from the sons of men. The giants imitate the sins, uh, imitate sorry. The giants imitate the sins of their fathers and take for themselves wives and animal mates. And they begot Nephel, uh, Nephel and Eliel. God, seeing all this wickedness, sends Enoch to declare Shamhaza and the fallen watchers that they will be soon punished for causing the earth to be corrupted. It'd be interesting to do a dive into Nephel. In Elio, so Nephil is spelled N-A-P-H-I-L, and Elio is spelled E-L-I-Y-O. These are the offspring of the um, giants with uh, men and um, animals. Those two types. <clears throat> Chapter 4. Enoch is sent by the righteous watchers to rebuke the fallen watchers and to declare to them their doom. He comes to Azazel first and condemns him as their principal sinner amongst the fallen watchers. He then summons Mahawe to him and has him gather all the watchers for his message. Enoch enters the assembly of the fallen watchers and gives them the message of doom. They weep and lament and beg Enoch to present to God their petition for mercy and a second chance to restore them to the former glory and that their sons might have eternal life. They require a messenger to talk to God because God has since talk, stopped talking to them after their transgression. Enoch hears their case and tells them he will talk to God on their behalf. Chapter 5. Enoch, having written the petition of the fallen watchers and discussing it with God, receives a vision from God as a response. And Enoch writes the vision for the fallen watchers in a book and gives the book to them. Enoch declares to them they will no longer be forgiven and describes for them his ascent into the presence of God where he was given a message for them. Chapter 6. Enoch receives from God an answer for the fallen watchers. He is told to them why they were not given permission to have sex and what their punishment is because of it. And he foretells unto them the miserable doom and fate of the offspring of the fallen watchers and foretells to them that they will become evil spirits 
and will not have, e have eternal life, but that their years will be no more than 500. Wow, they live for 500 years. See, a lot of these things I did not know. After hearing this, the fallen watchers and their giant sons take up stones to throw at Enoch, but the holy watchers shield Enoch from their deadly blows and lift Enoch up into the heavens to escape their earthly wrath against Enoch the messenger. This is perhaps the first time that any one will ever attempt to kill the messenger. Whoa, so God lifted Enoch to escape the watchers from, from killing Enoch. Very interesting. Chapter 7. See, these are a lot of things they don't teach you in church because a lot of the pastors don't read the extra biblical literatures. Which you can take with a grain of salt. But according to um, Rick Renner, he says the first 36 predate most of the Bible. And they're authentic. They're authentic texts. Thousands of years old. Or believed to be at least. Chapter 7. Hirabash kidnaps another giant's wife and starts a war among the giants. When the war was ending, one of Oliah's companions was killed by Maui. Oya mourns with his father Shamhaza about his friend, and they curse Maui. Maui defends himself, appealing to the words of his father, Bakalo, as justification. Oya gets angry and attempts to kill Maui, but Gilgamesh, remember the, the story of Gilgamesh, right? It's another interesting one to read, a very ancient text. Again, not scripture, but ancient text. And the other giants prevent Ohia from doing so, and they ward off Ohia's murderous intentions. This is where we learn about Gilgamesh slaying dragons or dinosaurs and being a hero for the normal-sized men of that time. Chapter 8 Gilgamesh has a dream, but interprets it as indicating that the giants will be punished. The giants celebrate, but aren't entirely convinced. And subsequent to this, Ohaya and Haya have dreams of their own. They seek the interpretation of the dreams, but none of the giants can declare to them what the meaning of their dreams are. So the giants have Maui go to Enoch in order to learn from him the meaning of the dreams and to learn what the fate of the giants will be. Maui flies to Enoch, and Enoch greets Maui. So remember, they, you know, we have all these um, things that are seen from the air uh, made on the earth. They're like pictograms made on the ground, right? And so they go, oh, the ancients must have flew. Of course they flew. I mean, if, if humans are smart enough to learn to fly, these guys are just as smart, if not more smart. So... In that intelligence, you know, you have things like here, Mahawe flies to Enoch. But you have to remember that the fallen angels are very intelligent. And uh, the giants are taught their ways and some of the humans are taught their ways. So what do angels do? They fly in scripture. At least they do. Okay. <clears throat> flies to Enoch and greets Mahawe. And Mahawe explains why he came. And Enoch proceeds to give Mahawe the answer. And he writes it down in a tablet and gives the second tablet as well to Mahawe, intended for Shahanza and the Watchers. And he sends Mahawe back to the giants with the two tablets. So the tablets are written up after Enoch ascends and talks to God. And now he's given it to, uh, to Mahawe to give back to the giants. Chapter 9. And the, basically the giants and the Watchers are all asking for forgiveness from God. And <clears throat> God's saying, no way. Chapter 9, Mahawe flies back to the giants with the two tablets, and Mahawe tells them of his journey to Enoch and Enoch saving his life, and tells them that Enoch had given him two tablets and revealed everything they had wanted to know from him. Oh, it says form him, but I think there's a mistype over here. From him. The first tablet is read. The giants discuss the contents of the first tablet after it is being read and realize they are doomed, and they lament over their miserable fate. They have the second tablet read. Enoch tells Shahaza that he and the other fallen watchers will soon be bound, <clears throat> but that the giants should repent and pray, for they still have a chance to benefit from reformation of their lives. Chapter 10. 
Shemhaza urges his two sons, Olaya and ha uh, Haria, to reform their lives in the hopes that they will yet be given mercy. Ohaya and Haya uh, listen to the advice of Shemhaza and attempt to convince the giants to reform themselves. You have to remember if there's any H's, H's were considered holy and life in, uh, in Hebrew. So Ohaya and Haya and Shemhaza, all these H's, right, are like the life and abundance of God. It's breath. <clears throat> Anyways, teaching them that, uh, that's just an extra little piece of information, teaching them that through Proverbs, where true success is found, the giants seek to reform their lives. Enoch, which also has an H, by the way, is sent to declare the watchers that within 120 years, they will all be bound in dark prison of punishment for their sins, and that their sons would all be destroyed from off the face of the earth. Noah begins to build the ark around this time. Only Azazel is bound. So God only takes one and, and binds him in chapter 10. And by chapter 10, Noah's already building the ark. You can see how the um, Enoch and Noah are all integrated together in the story for the cleansing of the earth from the giants, from the fallen angels, from their seed, yada yada. Chapter 11. The giants lament over Azazel being bound. The giants, uh, oh, lament. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because he was the leader of the fall. And they, and then they, and the watchers, seeing that they are were not bound or destroyed, um, vaunted themselves. I wonder what vaunted is. It's V-A-U-N-T-E-D. When this happened... Gabriel, the archangel, was sent to incite the giants to commit civil war against themselves and their offspring. And they all began to kill each other. And the watchers beheld the destruction of their families. This is their reaction to the situation here. They start killing each other. When the war of the giants ends with few survivors, all the fallen watchers are subsequently bound by the angels into dark prison of punishment. And then we get to the conclusion here, chapter 12. Noah goes into the ark, and the flood comes and begins to kill all life. But not all the giants are killed by the flood. Look at that, because there's still giants in the land after the flood comes and goes, if you remember in scripture. And this explains that here in chapter 12. I'll read that again. Noah goes into the ark, the flood comes, and begins to kill all life. Begins to kill all life. But not all the giants are killed by the flood. Not all of them are killed. In order to fix this, uh, Yahuwah, which is Y-E-H-U-W-E-H, -E -E sends the Leviathan. And the Leviathan begins to kill all the giants and their sons who survived. Yikes. Oh yeah, alone survives the attack of the Leviathan and kills the Leviathan. Wow, the Leviathan's killed. Ohaya, I'll read that again. Ohaya alone survives the attacks of the Leviathan and kills the Leviathan. The archangel, Raphael, is sent by Yahuwah in order to punish Ohaya for killing the Leviathan and to finally restore the earth to purity. Ohaya is killed and bound in the dark prison of punishment with the fallen watchers. Purity, Ohaya, yeah. So Yahuwah and Ohaya. So Ohaya is the one who kills the Leviathan and Yahuwah, who sent the Leviathan, now is sent to, to finish the deed, basically, and um, kill Ohaya. And put in a dark prison of punishment with the watchers. The flood being over and the giants and their sons still remaining on the earth without bodies become evil spirits. So now they're all killed and they become evil spirits. This is where we get things like demons and, and evil spirits. So it's, it's good to know the difference between uh, fallen angels, demons, and evil spirits. They all three are different. The flood being over and the giants and their sons still remaining on the earth without bodies become evil spirits and are given a law <coughs> by an angel of Yahuwah how they are to live if they want to avoid being sent into the dark prison of punishment that the watchers were sent to. Remember Jesus comes and he starts sending them in there because they, uh, they keep breaking this law, by the way. There are these heavenly laws and heaven and earth are connected and they can be applied to these evil spirits. And this explains how the Nephilim came to be on the earth after the flood. So somehow you get all these spirits and the Nephilim, you know, came to be 
on the earth after the flood because there's still giants after the flood comes. So I wonder if the, the Nephilim then are spirits or are they physical bodies? I don't yet understand because I thought they were all killed by Yahweh um, and even Ohio is locked away. But somehow, somehow the, the uh, giants still continue to be on the earth. <clears throat> Let us move into commentations, commentations on commentations. <clears throat> the reconstructed summary of the Book of Giants provides a de detailed account of the story of the Fallen Watchers their interactions with humanity, and the rise and fall of giants here um, is a concise breakdown. Chapter 1, the watchers distressed by human sin ask God to descend to earth to guide humans. God agrees. This also prepares the way for its descendants. Enoch becomes a mediator between humans and watchers. Chapter 2, human women seduced, uh, seduce the watchers, cursing the fall. The watchers now bound to flesh reveal heavenly and earthly secrets to their wives. Chapter 3, the Watcher's offspring, giants, emerge and wreak havoc, devouring everything, including humans. Enoch is sent by God to warn the Watchers of their impending punishment. Chapter 4, Enoch rebukes the fallen Watchers and delivers God's mercy of doom. They plead with Enoch to ask for God's mercy, but their fate is sealed. Chapter 5, Enoch records and delivers God's response to the fallen Watchers. There will be no forgiveness for their transgressions. Chapter 6, God's message clarifies why the Watchers were not permitted to have sexual relations and foretells the giant's doom. The Watchers and giants turn, to, turn on Enoch, but he is rescued by, uh, by righteous Watchers. Oh, interesting. So there's unrighteous and righteous Watchers. Great. That helps to clarify some things. Chapter 7, a war breaks out among the giants, sparked by uh, Habablesh, kidnapping another giant's wife. Gilgamesh and other and other giants try to resolve the conflict. I don't think Gil, uh, Gilgamesh is a giant, but he might be. Here. Gilgamesh and other giants. I think Gilgamesh is a man, but takes further study. Chapter 8. The giants have prophetic dreams, unable to interpret them. They send Mahawe to seek answers from Enoch, who gives Mahawe two tablets containing revelations about their fate. Chapter 9, Mahawe returns to the giants with the tablets, revealing their impending doom and urging them to repent and reform. Chapter 10, Shemaza encourages his sons and the giants to repent. Enoch prophesies the eventual punishment of the Watchers and the destruction of the giants. Chapter 11, Gabriel incites a civil war among the giants, leading to their self-destruction. The Watchers witness their family's demise before being bound by angels. Chapter 12. I think it's it, I think it skipped over. Oh no, here's Leviathan. Chapter 12. The flood comes, but some giants survive. The Leviathan is sent to kill the remaining giants. And Ohio, the last surviving giant, kills the Leviathan. Ohio is punished. And the surviving spirit of the giants become the Nephilim, bound by laws to avoid eternal punishment. The summary, this summary offers a rich narrative of rebellion, divine judgment, and the struggle between good and evil. Let us bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, I come before you acknowledging your greatness and holiness. You are the God of righteousness, and I seek your wisdom as I navigate the challenges of this world. Your word declares in Psalm 19, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Illuminate the ways of your truth, Lord, that I may walk in the light of your commandments. Help me to remember the lessons of the past as recorded in the book of Giants, where the watchers fell into sin and corruption, leading to their downfall, as in 1 Enoch 6, 1-6. Lord, guard my heart against temptation. As the watchers were seduced by their desires of their flesh, I pray for the strength to resist the allure of this world. According to James 1, 14 to 15, reminds us, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Protect me from the snares of my enemy, that I may not fall into the same traps. I ask for your grace to cover me, Yeshua HaMashiach, the blood of Jesus, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Holy Spirit, as 
Romans 5.20 states, Where sin increased, grace abounds all the more. Let your grace abound in my life, transforming my heart and renewing my spirit, that I may reflect your love and righteousness. In your mercy, Lord Yeshua, as you sent Enoch to deliver your message to the fallen watchers, may I also be a vessel for your truth, Yahweh Vahe. Empower me to share your gospel boldly, reminding others of the hope found in Yeshua HaMashiach. Let my words be seasoned with salt, bringing life to those who hear, according to Colossians 4, verse 6. I claim the promise of 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, which says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I humble myself before you now, repenting of any sins and seeking your face, Yeshua, asking for healing for our land and restoration for your people, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord Yeshua, I pray for protection and deliverance from evil, as you have declared in Matthew 6.13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. May your angels surround me and my loved ones, guarding us from harm, according to Psalm 91.11. Thank you, Father, Abba Father, for hearing my prayers. I trust in your unfailing love and faithfulness. May my life be a testament to your glory and grace shining brightly in a dark world. In the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. And we will close with a song titled, so I'll read it from my phone here. <clears throat> the song is The Grieved Watcher's Lament. And this is from the summary of the Book of Giants. From the heavens they look down, grieved by sins that wear the crown. The watchers weep, their hearts in pain. Let us teach them to refrain. O Lord, hear our cry, guide us to the righteous sky. With your mercy show the way, in our hearts the truth convey. Azazel's call, the path prepared, the fallen angels' hearts laid bare. In, fresh, in fleshly bonds their glory lost, for sins they pay the cost. O Lord, hear our cry, guide us to the righteous sky. With your mercy show the way, in our hearts let truth convey. Shemhaza leads, the darkness swells, their offsprings rise as sin compels. In greed and pride they seek their feast, feast, yet mercy still can grant release. O Lord, hear our cry, guide us to the righteous sky. With your mercy show the way, in our hearts let truth convey. Enoch speaks the truth revealed to the watchers, hearts unsealed. Your doom is set, but hope remains. Repent and break these wicked chains. O Lord, hear our cry. Guide us to the righteous sky. With your mercy, show the way. In our hearts, let truth convey. In unity, we seek your grace. Restore our hearts, our rightful place. As watchers grieve, we'll learn and stand in righteousness, hand in hand. And that's Micah 6, 8 for the last one. Shalom and shalom until next time. May God keep you and bless you. Bye-bye for now.